Um, so to begin with, Elizabeth Pritchard, uh, tenure at Goldman Sachs, AIG, Crux, and now the founder of White Rock Data Solutions. Something interesting about your background? My background. Um, or something you're I own, excited I own about. a ranch down in Florida, and I have a herd of goats, which I just love. <laughs> and uh, it, uh, it, it uh, gives me a little respite from uh, my data passion, uh, equipping um, data scientists and quants with the data they need to uh, achieve the insights they're looking for. Fantastic. Uh, Brian Snyder, leading IBM Watson's weather company effort. Uh, some great examples tonight of how trading desks are using weather in their commodity market efforts. Uh, something interesting about your background or uh, that you're particularly excited about in terms of data? Yeah, sure, thanks. Um, I've, I've, actually, I've been in analytics for over 15 years and as a program application developer as well. And over the years, I've found there really hasn't been enough compute power to really out there answer all the questions with all of this data. And now, finally, we're in a stage where that does exist. And we are able to make these correlations. And I'm able to build these predictive models with my customers now that do provide more accurate insights. So we live in a great time, and that excites me, because uh, it wasn't always like that. You know, It was always the dream, but you just couldn't do it. And now, now you can. So. Thank you. Uh, Peter McGinnis, history at Standard Poor's and now leading Equ Equifax Capital Markets effort with impacts to equity, credit, and corporate worlds. <laughs> um, yeah, I was with the S&P for about 10 years. So I'm talking to you from my experience is mostly a fixed income background. Um, and I think maybe one of the more interesting things about the data, my first data, big data experiment started with, uh, if you've seen the movie or read the book, The Big Short, uh, we were involved with some of the early data efforts to join mortgage loan level data with anonymous uh, borrower data. So it's kind of interesting because if you see, uh, if you've seen the movie or read the book, you'll understand that that was the first initial list of clients that we started working on big data projects with. Fantastic. And then uh, Michael Beal, uh, distinguished background at Morgan Stanley, TPG, JP Morgan, and founder now of Data Capital Management. Something interesting or you're particularly excited about? Uh, well, I'm excited to be here and to share the room with uh, Eris and everybody else. Um, interesting, I started off on this journey back in 2008 when I was a discretionary investor at TPG Capital. I started to believe that the work I did was going to be automated in the future and that machines would eventually do my job. Uh, I then pivoted, uh, ended up co-founding the Big Data Machine Learning Group at J.P. Morgan, um, and then launching a systematic machine learning fund around that and opening that up for research. Across that point, uh, I really have seen the full life cycle from the first sentiment analysis symposium back in 2010 when there was about a third of the people uh, in, of this room in that attendance, and when I went to the conference last year, it was about 2,500 people. Uh, I agree with uh, Eris's point that we certainly are at an inflection point and um, it's uh, offered interesting opportunities and have gone from being laughed at to uh, now almost seem like I'm uh, just uh, regurgitating what others are saying. Fantastic. <clears throat> Um, so why don't we talk about what type of data uh, that the group maybe thinks has been some of the most interesting recently. And in particular, if you could kind of segment your comments to corporate uses, um, public and private asset management uses, just to give a sense for how people are using it in different uh, functions. Uh, and maybe let's start by talking about uh, some recent breakthrough uh, or kind of clear victory in your efforts as, as you've been using uh, data in, in different ways. Um, and maybe with this, we could start with, uh, I think, uh, kind of Brian and Peter's uh, backgrounds. I know you have had some interesting use cases. Um, maybe we can start there and then we'll open it up to the rest of the panel. Sure, uh, I'd be happy to start. Um, when it comes to buy side, sell side, we, we have a, a large number of commodity traders and energy traders who have successfully used our uh, our, our weather data, which is very hyper-local, very local, you know, versus compared to the nearest airport, in order to make trade decisions. No, no one's, no one stepped up and said, "Here's, here's what actually made me successful." Because as traders, they want to keep that a secret. So I don't, unfortunately, have any specific names that I can share with you, but we do have a huge group within the weather company that deals particularly with traders that use our seasonal forecast that goes out out, out to seven months. 
uh, that helps them, you know, do I buy energy now? Do I buy it later? Uh, if I'm, you know, looking at corn, there's, uh, you know, what, what's the risk with corn for some of my agricultural customers? A lot of sectors actually, you know, get affected that are within financial services, like insurance. It's kind of a, kind of a, a one-off to, with weather. So, so you know, be able to understand risk, where that risk is going to occur, what kind of severe weather is there, and, and taking, now like with Lucina and many other partners and channel partners I work with, hey, let's we have data you know from historical weather back to 1979 by hour, right? Let's let's marry that with all of our historical trades. And try to come up. That's just another data set that you know we're talking about Lucene and others about, but improving their algorithms and, and getting more accurate results. So if you're a quant or a data scientist, and you, you're looking to increase your accuracy with another data set, a lot, a lot of that I've been coming across a lot of those kind of scenarios now. So that's buy side. Of course, weather is used across the industry, any sector. Retail is a very large one, and a lot of times trades are made based on how is the company doing in terms of sales. Uh, maybe, maybe they're a, uh, uh, a product company, so the CPG customer, right? And there's a lot of that IRI data out there that we have. We have a, you know, a way of marrying that old, that hi historic IRI data to be able to understand buying behaviors, inventory behaviors, working with Wegmans and, and, and different uh, uh, retail uh, grocery stores. How do, how, what do I stock on the shelves? When, when will things you know, run out? So because all that other data is available, IRI data, there's, there's sentiment data, all of that can be pulled in together. And when you're looking at CBG customers, our weather data helps give the better insights there. A, a good example was, I have two good examples. One is with uh, here in New York City with uh, uh, One World Observatory. Uh, we, we were able to look at, you know, uh, when do we, we were trying to help them staff appropriately because they were spending too much money on, on staff, and, and, and often they found that they were short staff. So, so we used weather data with their retail data uh, on, on attendance, and we were able to come up with predictive insights. So when our most accurate forecast showed a 15-day trend they, that says, hey, maybe we don't need people on these days, we're able to come up with a decision, right? Not just data that they had to make a decision on, Here's the prediction. It's, it's, it's been 90% likely that with these conditions in the past, when it's rain, when the temperature is like this, in this range, and the humidity and the precipitation, that's what's happened most often in the past. We can prove that statistically. So why don't you change the number of people that you, that you bring into work over the next week or so? And we did that, and that saved them over $100,000 a year. Uh, another good example is in agriculture slash CPG, which is, uh, a consumer, uh, a Scott's Miracle Grow. Um, we've all gotten ads on our phone. And the question is, like, when do you send the ad out? Who do you send it to? I want to send the right ad to the right person at the right time. So, uh, Scott's was using our our, our forecast and, and saw that it was going to be seasonally different than what it has been in the past year. So they they offset a marketing campaign a few months which actually ended up in double digit profits because of the, they timed that just, just at the right time. So that kind of insight of, you know, what's that weather like in the past and moving forward, they're making a change in, in, in the way that they deliver their marketing campaigns. And lastly, sorry if I'm going too long here, but there's so many use cases I could go for forever, but it's even more hyperlocal. I was talking to one of you in the audience earlier with uh, the North Face, where we're actually tracking people in the store and while they're in the store, sending them the right ad based on a predictive model. So the weather, and this was really happened for real life. I was part of that. It was awesome. And I love the North Face, and I'm a huge skier, so I couldn't have loved it even more. But, but yeah, we were actually not only be able to see where do they spend the most time in the store, which helped them determine discounts and, and so on, and where do I put items on the shelf, we were actually able to add, send the right ad to the right person at the right time who had their app in the store when they walked right by you know, the pullovers, because they were male that was in this age category with this income level, uh, just to reinforce that concept that, that you brought up that let's take all the data in the past, marry it with weather, and it tells, a, it tells a real story that you can repeat. And I'll end it on that, so that's just a couple examples. That's great, thank you. And I just add to that, I don't, weather was pretty interesting for us um, on uh, investment pieces back around Brexit, uh, which was, around, I won't go into the details, but the, 
machine learning, both, as Eris mentioned, kind of gives you a prediction, and then it'll talk about what seems to really matter around there. Uh, and the thing that it really picked up on uh, the Brexit election, amongst other factors, was the weather that was taking place in London during that time period. And when you look back and you take a historical time series of merging both the weather data and voter turnout and election data, you actually do see that the elasticity of demand associated with, or supply in terms of the turnout, associated with those who are likely to vote for the incumbent versus the disruptor is very different. Uh, and in this context, the people who were likely to vote for stay, when you had bad weather, they thought it was going to happen, they didn't show up as much uh, as the people who were more focused on uh, the leave. And that actually led to one of the core factors that uh, did that. For any more detail, actually, uh, the day before Brexit, uh, I walked through this analysis on CNBC. Uh, and it's a good example of how weather actually uh, helped to uh, pre predict an outlier event. That's a good kind of, uh, I think, inroad to our next question, does alternative data really work? And <laughs> um, maybe we could talk about some of the most important criteria and factors in selecting the inputs uh, in the process, and maybe, Erez, you want to kick us off. Well, the, the true answer is it doesn't always work, and uh, people have to realize this is not a magic pill. Uh, you have to look at the... Uh, uh, probability of success, right? This is kind of what you are uh, looking at because there's so many factors that are unknown uh, to the data and to the machine that sometimes comes in the in the way, right? So we're looking at the statistical significance to uh, identify what's going to work or not. Uh, but it's true. One of the um, machine learning process processes is feature selection by feature importance. So you have lots of data that can be really meaningful in different times <coughs> for different situations. And uh, the ability to identify which ones matter when is really critical, and it's a pretty typical machine learning problem that can be solved uh, with the proper algorithm. And then, uh, Elizabeth, maybe uh, drawing on some of your background at Crux in terms of the inputs and kind of the process that goes into preparing data, any thoughts in terms of kind of how uh, some of the community should think about selecting the right vendors and, and bringing those inputs in? Sure, I can comment on that. Um, when you take a look at the data value chain and you take a look at, um, you know, you've got a data source and you, maybe it's a fundamental manager and you have a question, or it could even be systematic, right? You just want, a, you know, a lot of data. There's a lot of friction in that process. Um, so, um, you know, there's friction in trying to, you know, get access to the data. There's friction in the commercial process. Um, so there's there's a lot of friction in the process that I think, um, you know, cr at Crux was trying to solve around the data delivery. And what I'm looking at now is post the delivery, how do we remove friction from the process of getting that data set prepared for the machine learning use case? And, um, you know, I was thinking about it as like, what other industry does a customer buy a product and then have to spend a bunch of money getting the product ready to use? And I couldn't think of another industry. I'm sure they exist, but so it's, it's, it's you know, uh, it's like I'm going to buy this data set and then the vendor, and the, and the vendor, sorry guys, I, I bought a lot of data at Coleman. Uh, and, and, and then the, then the vendor expects, expe this is generalization, not everybody's like this, probably not the people in the room, but then the vendor expects you to take it all when you only need some features. And then you got to scrub it. You've got to, you know, get it into shape, into numbers, and you know, uh, address the missing values and all of that kind of good stuff, so that your model can consume it. And um, and so I think that this notion of preparing data sets, uh, w which I would call a data product, then, which is, so it's like a data set, kind of a more of a raw material, and then it needs to get into a data product form ready for machine learning. And um, I think we can crack this code and we can make this uh, stream a lot more smooth, then we're gonna have a lot more innovation and you're gonna have a lot more data sets, uh, data scientists out there um, to consume. And, um, and, so, and so is that, and I think there are different ways to crack it. One is I think the suppliers, the data suppliers can learn more about their customer use case and do some of that work and embed that in your products up front. Uh, and then I think also there, there's uh, you know, certainly a rich startup community 
uh, being fo you know, out there and, and also uh, continuing to form, which is addressing this problem. So um, a lot of work yet, yet, yet to be done, but um, you know, I think it's kind of the end of the beginning. We're on our way. I want to draw out some more of the use cases. We uh, talked a little bit about offline, and I think uh, Peter and then perhaps Michael, um, can you talk a little bit about PG&E and kind of uh, some of the examples that you saw there and how that was a, a pretty exciting uh, use case? Want to go first? Or I don't know anything about PG&E. PG &E. Okay, sure. So, uh, I thought it was your data. <laughs> switching over to the uh, slide. So what, uh, on the call yesterday, there were two directions. One, be very brief. Uh, two, uh, focus in on tangible use cases. And I take my homework from Eris, so I did that. Uh, <laughs> if you wouldn't mind just swipping over to the other slide, whoever's in the back controlling that. Um, so one thing that I think is valuable around alternative data is just this question as to there's a question as to whether you want to fully automate and just trust the output of the uh, machine or whether you want to also kind of have a second independent opinion. In this case, uh, the question uh, for one of our investor clients was around they thought this kind of rebound that you see here uh, taking place was something that was going to be mean reverting back to its 52 week average and they wanted some help around thinking about position sizing. Uh, what you did here is just the integration of price, fundamental, and ESG data, and then taking simple KPI forecasts around return, revenue, and ESG. And what we saw here as you looked at ESG, which is bringing up this idea, like we always think of it as it's just a filter uh, that you do for some reporting, but is there some actual alpha? And what it actually picked up on here as to why it was calling it a, a strong short was this idea around its energy management, its labor practices, as well as its uh, relationships with the local government uh, within there. And you can kind of see it in word print, although it's small and fuzzy, uh, what's driving that. And so, you know, whether you want to systematically, as you would with Ares, kind of trade that under a separately managed account, or if you just need an uh, independent second opinion. Those are some of the places that machine learning can really add value, being able to identify not just the fundamental price, the economics, but in this case, a, a focus around some of those ESG things. And I just found that to be pretty interesting, given that most people don't think of it as an insightful alpha. And I think it's a good example as to it's really what you do with it and what you combine it with as to whether there's likely to be value. Um, Catherine, did you want to uh, pose this Slido question to the audience? We were curious how many of you are currently using alternative data. And I think you can enter your answers on uh, Slido. And then uh, maybe while uh, the audience is working through that, uh, just returning to, uh, to the panel, Peter, uh, can you walk through some of the use cases that you've presented? I think you've been working on some interesting things with ERAs, and, and it's spanned uh, several markets, and love to hear about that. Yes, um, thank you so much. It's, for me, this started off, and to be clear, the data that we're offering is fully anonymized large modeling data sets, okay? So let's not think about uh, personally identifiable information or anything like that. But the first time I heard about this, and this is the reason why we kind of pursued it with Eris as well, is I had a longtime client that started asking about retail cards. And for my, as I said before, I have a fixed income background. I'm like, why do you care about retail cards? Uh, they get rarely securitized, you know, Cabela's got a couple, that's about it. Why do you want to spend money on data for that? And the answer was, you're right, I don't care about retail. I don't care about securitizations. What I want to know is, what type of losses do retail cards take in stress scenarios over time? And then why do you want to know that? I cover Sonobis, I want to see if their loss reserves are correct, or if they're going to be changing their loss reserves or what their loss reserves might be in the future if the economy goes one way or another. Uh, from that, we started talking about some of the more obvious uh, use cases, which were uh, finance companies, lending companies, et cetera. You know, the application of consumer credit data is pretty obvious there. Uh, the interesting thing is when we engaged with Lucina, we started talking about more consumer-focused companies. So. My favorite is the idea of using home equity and home install and, and um, home improvement loans and looking at those and focusing on those, as well as other factors. Now, what do people use those loans for? For home improvement, right? 
Where does home improvement money go? It goes to Lowe's and Home Depot. And I'm telling you in our data what type of utilization in HELOC rates and home improvement loans is going on in a time series that goes back to 2005 that you can correlate and back test. It's an input into a model. And I would also say that this is only the first, we've looked at other things as well, but this is one of the more significant ideas of if any company has a consumer input or you know a consumer facing business then don't you want to know about the consumers and how they're doing and their geography and how they're paying their bills that's it Rez, i know you've been working uh with them quite a bit you want to add some commentary on kind of some of the methodology that you've used to uncover uh, some of the kpis and and ways that you've been able to uh, be effective with that Sure, I'm going to have to walk a very fine line here because of uh, the uh, NDA. You know, uh, I have the client here right next to me, um, but I'll do my best to make sure I uh, give you enough flavor. Look, uh, here, here is the problem that we're trying to solve, and I think Elizabeth was really spot on, and she described the real challenge of the market. You know, you have six terabytes of data coming from Equifax that can tell you the state of the consumer health across the United States at any given time. This is powerful information, folks. It's something that's not available you know, in a, in, in a news, newspaper or Bloomberg. This is what we call a very valuable, powerful data. Now, most companies are not able to ingest six terabytes worth of data, create the feature engineering, then, you know, normalize the values, create machine learning models, test them, evaluate them, and then produce an outcome that can be easily consumed by the portfolio manager. So our goal was to try and help, so Equifax has a very strong presence with the credit market, they've been doing it for years, very successfully, have shown the value to the government and the credit um, um, uh, sectors. What uh, we were trying to do is show maybe a more accessible, easily consumable outcome from Equifax's data. We created three derived offerings that are very easy to consume. You don't have to be a rocket scientist. You don't have to be a machine learning expert. You have to be a business-minded professional and consume those signals and actually act upon them. Three types of offerings. The first one is model portfolio. This is basically taking the signals out of uh, Equifax's data and perpetually, not historically in backtest, perpetually on an ongoing basis, identifying how these signals can be translated to alpha. We have three sectors, um, home uh, improvement or home builders. The other one is retail, and the third one is uh, leisure. Okay, so we've done uh, that research. We have some uh, pretty interesting results. Um, for those who are more fundamental based, we have KPI forecasting, and that's basically a report that shows the growth sales projection projections of the company. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, Taylor is in the back. You can talk to him. Um, um, you know, he's not a sales guy. He's a quant, and he can he can tell you the truth. You know, they can <laughs> tell you uh, <laughs> stories. Uh, but uh, we are getting 61 percent of the time. We are in some cases outperforming the street consensus. Now, that's pretty powerful stuff. And again, it's all driven from that kind of powerful data. Now, truth be told. The idea is to combine that data with other factors, right? So we have uh, yeah. folks from uh, ADP here, uh, folks that other types of consumer health um, notional values. You correlate that with some weather data, and guess what? Mm -hmm. We have a really nice picture that can tell you about the consumer health, and that's really the beauty of, uh, of this technology. Fantastic. Uh, so I thought it was pretty interesting. The results uh, look fairly uh, decided that people are beginning to get some good use out of uh, alternative data. I think, Catherine, you had another uh, slide for us, you know, for, for your business per year category, corporate, uh, buy side, private equity. Um, is that how, how necessary is this? By the way, while people are responding to this question, I have to tell you I was uh, speaking at a J.P. Morgan uh, conference just earlier this year. And the same question was posed uh, to uh, big asset managers. How many of you are using alternative data and how many are, are, are planning on using it in the next, next 12 months? And uh, it was kind of flipped for what you've seen here. It was mm -hmm. about 5% you know, are looking to use it. Most of the people that I've seen at that conference are not using alternative data at all. Uh, but it's true, we do see a meaningful shift in uh, market sentiment. All of us probably are, are facing that. 
in the last few months, and uh, it's hopefully it continues, uh, uh, and I'm sure it will. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And then, Catherine, I think you had one on uh, pricing. So this um, certainly touches a third rail in, in the industry. Around, uh, if it is useful, um, then what's the right uh, way to pay for this? And I'd like to get, uh, Elizabeth, your thoughts on you know, how the industry has been dealing with the, the concept of pricing. And you s have seen this from multiple sides. You've been a buyer and yeah, you've been, been, buyer and a uh, been part of the infrastructure in, in terms of uh, creating, you know, usable inputs and so I'd love to get your thoughts on kind of what do you think the primary factors are in deciding pricing yeah so uh, pricing is um, pricing is essential okay so I think that um, it's it is a science and an art and I think that as a data provider uh, or, you know or a, a, you're, you're providing a tool or service You've got, and you think it's really cool, uh, you've got to be able to price it at a point, obviously, where you can pay for sales motion. You, got to, you can pay for that uh, go-to-market uh, motion, marketing, sales, uh, you know, uh, getting your product tested. And so you need to know your costs. You need to know, right, how, uh, how expensive, you know, how, what your, your cost equation is to put that data service together both the content as well as the data operation and the ongoing upkeep of that data set uh, to meet your customer requirements. And then on top of that, right, you've got to add your sales motion. You've got to add your go-to-market on top of that. And then, you know, a little bit of margin, then you get to your price. I mean, essentially that's it, right? And, um, and so you've got to do that equation with, you know, uh, factoring that in if you want to make money in the business, right? So. So where does that price land you? I mean, uh, I can tell you kind of some averages of what we're seeing kind of in the, uh, if, if you kind of look at um, data sets that are maybe early to market or uh, maybe there isn't uh, a ton of established demand quite yet, they're kind of in the curve of like 30 to $75,000 annual subscription uh, for a uh, fund that is, um, you know, maybe it's uh, uh, you have a central group and you're feeding some pods, but not a massive firm like Goldman. Okay, and then, then you're talking an enterprise agreement. You have, you know, you have to understand the use that's being used across the whole firm, and then you charge more for that. So that's a tailored solution. So that's kind of like the market. And then I think if you have a, a higher quality, more in-demand sets, like maybe some of my colleagues here, uh, if you have a more in-demand set. You, you know, uh, you're going to be looking at the, I would say the low single digits, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I think that's kind of the market out there. But the bottom line is you got to charge a price. Or you're going to make some money or you're just not going to be in business going forward. And honestly, the buyers know that, you know, we would know that we would know if somebody was coming in and they were low balling it and we, we would be like, I don't know, this doesn't, how is this going to persist? over time so you know if you can explain then and if you can explain that pricing model you're not going to divulge your costs but if you can explain that uh, coherently to your buyers they at least to have an understanding of why the price why that particular price Michael I know you had a number of roles on both sides of the industry in terms of uh, asset management and uh, also creating some data um, mm -hmm. how are you thinking about this challenge I think it's a it's a big bottleneck towards real adoption uh, right now. Um, what you laid out, which I think is smart, is kind of a willingness to provide, but then there's also kind of what is the actual value yeah. and kind of more traditional economic yeah. uh, approaches to the creation. And that portion just isn't clear. Yeah. And I've now recently been on both sides of that, of kind of always being just the one just saying I'll pay as little as I can and I basically said what's your average and I'll pay like 25% of that and 50% of that and that was the way I went. Um, but trying to have a market discovery I think is something that is a, a big issue now. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that actually I, I serve as the co-chair of the FISD Alternative Data Standards uh, Committee for which Tracy in the back uh, is leading that and we just talked about that like for the mm -hmm. standard questionnaire that we're trying to bring standards to the industry 
what is your average budget? How do you think about it? And to your point, that is such taboo that we were really running back into something I've talked about for a long time of instead of tragedy of the commons, sharing these things and leading to commoditization, we have a tragedy of the anti-commons, keeping information to ourselves, not sharing it, leading to a Pareto inefficient outcome. Mm -hmm. Now, there will be somebody who's gonna step in and have to be a market interface associated with that, very much the way that risk metrics and market served in the very early days with the large banks. Um, but that's a natural evolution associated with any industrial or technological revolution. But certainly something that uh, I'd like to see uh, more path towards, but unfortunately it's very much a case-by-case -case idiosyncratic um, discussion. Uh, at least that's what we've seen. Maybe I'll just kind of um, shift the question a little bit and talk about some of the challenges, uh, cultural process oriented that you know we've had to kind of overcome to be able to put data to actual effective use, mm -hmm. the importance of having a good process. And maybe, um, uh, Michael, just while you have the mic, we'll talk a little bit about you know what are some of the things that you've uh, seen that have driven kind of some of the breakthroughs of you I know you've worked with uh, a lot of clients who are trying to execute data strategies and if you could just um, very succinctly kind of address what are some of the things that have helped you to communicate with the different languages you see out there sure I'll just lay out the first one and then maybe we can go around maybe I'll come back the first thing is we all come from a world of monolithic architectural structures uh, and every process is very long and it's integrated within there uh, the world of big data is actually started as a technology term, not a data alternative data stuff. And that was all based around parallel modular processes. So mm -hmm. the lack of us, uh, particularly the newer companies all have it, but the lack of the larger companies having very modular architectures makes it very difficult to actually think about breaking down the subcomponents that go into data acquisition, structuring, filtering, cleansing, training, mm -hmm. validation, execution. Right? It's all one, and therefore it's very difficult for people who have that type of an approach to be able to bring in the best-in-class third-party vendors to solve very specific problems. And as a result, you have to think about who is that person who can be the you know, highest average across the variety of problems that I have. Uh, so it's gonna, it threatens to turn this into a sustaining innovation as opposed to a really disruptive one. But I do hope that at least the cost structure argument is going to force people to make the decisions on the cloud, which then pre-necessitates the requirements to have modular architectures, which therefore will enable Crux to do a much better job in that integration without forcing somebody to make a huge decision about disrupting their entire process. Rez, I know you have some opinions here. <clears throat> yeah, so... Um, <clears throat> some, perhaps some battle scars as well. <laughs> Look, um, I want to tell you something. Uh, our quant and data scientists truly work tirelessly to make sure that the results are defensible. I mean, what they are going to be most embarrassed about if they come up with a result that somebody's going to be able to poke holes in. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you in the beginning, when we just formed the company, we were very naive, uh, and we had some scars. You know, people threw us out of the office, uh, people um, poked holes and asked questions we didn't have good answers for. Uh, but over time, uh, that made us stronger because we were able to uh, create a truly defensible outcome from our research. Um, it takes uh, a lot of effort, a lot of tries, a lot of uh, dead ends to, to get to a, an outcome that you feel comfortable delivering to a client that's going to put a lot of money behind. And in a way, uh, the stake of that investment is going to be sitting uh, partially uh, under your responsibility. And we take it very seriously. Um, so we had built, um, and that's kind of what we've done internally, uh, all the defense mechanism to ensure that when we come up with a product, it had gone through best practice in how we do um, out of sample back testing with uh, transaction costs and slippage and uh, identifying uh, how to borrow and short borrowing costs to really ensure that the simulation is as close as possible to uh, to the real real life scenario. Um, you know, we show people backtest, and the first thing they say to us, I never saw a bad backtest. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> because they only show the good ones. Um, so how do you create credible results? So you know what? Fine. Let me uh, give you a perpetually paper trading simulation of the same backtest over time. I want to publish the, the trades before the market opens. You can actually follow through with that on our platform and see how it goes. And they say, oh, that's great. But it's not real money, uh, so it's not good enough. And he said, okay, uh, here's a um, 
small amount of money uh, traded using that very same portfolio, and they say, oh, it's uh, really uh, small, I need to see a larger fund. Well, if I had a larger fund, I wouldn't be in that business. <laughs> <laughs> I would be doing something else now. But this is really a challenge that we have to face every day. Uh, but again, the good news is that those, um, those uh, constraints, those pushbacks are diminishing more and more now because people realize that they have to join the big data revolution. I mean, you either change or you die. And uh, yeah. I think we all believe in the same. Uh, this is really what's happening now. Mm -hmm. uh, others that would like to comment on ways that you've translated well to local language or kind of been able to bring uh, the use cases and make them alive for customers in a way that uh, was able to win them over. I could comment uh, on that. So um, I was been doing a bunch of research over the last um, couple of months about integrating the innovation. And um, it reminds me of, uh, I started my career in manufacturing at a short stint manufacturing when um, we started working with robots on the assembly line. And first, the first robot rolls out to the floor and uh, it brings up many um, considerations for the design of the ecosystem around the robot or the machine. So not only do you have the quant and the science and the data, but then you have the uh, explainability, you have the how are you running it in production, with, and then what, are, what is the talent required to run it in production, and what is that monitoring system, right? And what, are, what is that um, governance that is over the model and changes that might need to be made to the model, because um, the, the researchers or the quants may be on to the next problem. And then the production team, the operations team is left with the um, engagement with the machine. And, uh, and so the talent in many of our, our organizations today needs to be upskilled even in when that model is, is um, implemented into production. And then that has, um, uh, that has implications then for the leadership and do the leaders understand what they're managing and do they have that gut feel for like what could go wrong instinctively. And so there's kind of this new body of thought out there uh, or at least I've just run into the term, the organizational physics around implementing the machine learning. And so though all of those considerations, not only the data prep, right, it's like super important in the model, but that whole ecosystem inside the firm, maybe, you know, the, the systematic funds uh, grew up being designed that way, but if we're bringing the innovation into firms that haven't grown up that way, there are a lot of considerations in the organization that need to be addressed. Very good points. Mm -hmm.